Well, it would certainly appear that we are live on the Facebook. And that if we are indeed live on the Facebook right now, then someday we're going to be archived on YouTube. And also archived forever on Facebook. You see the address right there, as so you can guess what's happening right now. Malcolm Tent, P.O. Box 3626, Newtown, Connecticut, 06470. That can mean only one thing, and that is that it is I, it is me, Malcolm Tent, bringing you this week's episode of Tent Talks Tunes. Waka, waka, waka. Disco hands, baby. Disco. Disco will never die. Not as long as I've got anything to say about it. Mm, mm, mm. Yes, sirree. It's been a, been a long, strange, and rocking couple of weeks here in the world of old MT. Hello, everybody. <clears throat> One thing that does remain constant is the jug of Danbury Tap. 128 ounces of delicious, nutritious, heavy metal, fortified H2O. Straight from the aquifers of the Hat City. I raise my jug to you, my frantic fans, loyal listeners, and absolutely vivacious viewers. Let's see who's coming in. Who's tuning in right now? Who we got? We got Pear from Sweden, who is actually in Berlin tonight. Pear, what are you doing in Berlin? What's going on? On a, on a vacay? What are you doing? I want to know. From Sweden to Berlin. That's a pretty good move, dude. We got Alan saying, welcome back. Thank you. Good to be here. We got Ms. Gelman from Tucson, Arizona. And another bunch of you whose names I can't see, but I see the numbers. The numbers are there. And the numbers don't lie. You cannot confuse 9 with 10. You can't confuse 10 with 20. The numbers are right there, and they say that you guys are here with me to talk some tunes. <sighs> Excuse me. So, yep, I was not on the air last week or the week before. I was taking care of some business with the almighty anti-scene. And because of that, I would like to take the opportunity to thank the fine people of the cities of Atlanta, Charlotte, Chattanooga, and Nashville for giving us a fine, fun run of shows. We knocked them up and we, uh, well, that's not quite what I meant to say. We set them up and we knocked them down. A big difference between knocking them up and setting them down, if you know what I mean, Jelly Bean. We set them up and we knocked them down. And uh, the crowds were great. The performing was fun as always, and, um, <clears throat> excuse me, very glad that we got to go out and play for all of our people out there in those cities. And that's probably gonna be it, maybe, unless this other one gig comes through, but I'm not gonna say anything about that yet, because I don't know. Um, which leads us to check the bulletin board. As you know, here on Tent Talks Tunes, we like to check the bulletin board, we like to check the mailbox, and then we like to talk tunes. So let's see what's going on here, looking at the bulletin board. Well, kind of relating to what I was just talking about, we have one show that is absolutely confirmed for the year 2023 for the almighty anti-scene. We'll even take it off of the bulletin board and give you a close-up bird's eye view. Yes, Anti-Scene, the 40th anniversary show. 40 years of Destructo Rock are going to be celebrated Saturday, September 30th of this year at the Ground Zero in Spartanburg, South Carolina, our home away from home. It will feature not only this, the Ultra lineup, but it will feature a plethora of of anti-scene alum and special guests. And also opening for us will be the great Joe Buck yourself and the great Sweet George Brown. So that's going to be one uh, humdinger of a slam banger. September 30th at the Ground Zero in Spartanburg. There are hotel deals to be had. Tickets are on sale now. 
And if you need or want more information, go to antiscene.com or check out the Antiscene Facebook page or message me personally and I'll tell you everything I know. You can start me talking about that because I want to tell you everything I know. Hmm. So yeah, September 30th, kids, that's a thing that's happening in the future. But before that, we got a couple of really fine fun events. Oops, did you guys hear that little meowing, that squeaky cat voice? When you hear that voice, you know, you know what's about to happen. He's lurking around my ankles. He's looking up at me with those big yellow eyes of his. You guys can't see him, but he's down there. Yes, almost perfectly on cue. We have Harry the Cat. Yay, Harry. There he is with the aforementioned big yellow eyes. Hi, everybody. And the, the one and a half fangs in his face. Hi. Yes, Harry has become... Uh, a mostly indoor cat now. You can see the results of his being an outdoor cat. He's only got one and a half ears. Let's see if we can show the fangs. Show the people the fangs, man. He's got one and a half fangs. Kind of see. He's got the one protruding fang and only half of one that you can't really see. He's an alpha male, so in the days when he was an outdoors cat, he would go outside and get into fights with all the neighborhood cats. Um, which he would not always win, hence the crumpled cauliflower ear, which he got from being clawed or bitten by another cat. I'm going to imagine that he lost the half a fang by chomping on some other cat as well. So, Harry's an indoor cat now, and I'm not 100% sure he likes it, but I think it's much better for his health, and it saves me a lot of money on veterinarian bills, that's for dang sure. So there's Harry, saying hi. And away he goes. See you later, fella. You've got friends out there in the internet. Harry's my boy. Yeah, he is precious, Amy Lynn Myers. Very much so. I drink a toast of Danbury Tap to Harry the Cat. Mm-hmm. Ah. So, let's see. Where were we before that feline interruption? Well, I think we were looking at the bulletin board and a couple events. We started in September. Why don't we go to May, May 6th of this year, the Danbury Record and CD Expo. It's a big old record show co-promoted by me. Yes, indeed you do. I like to round up lots and lots of dealers from the New England area corral them and put them in one room, which in the in this case is the VFW Hall number 149. VF Hall, VFW Hall number 149 in downtown Danbury. We put all these dealers together in one big old room and we sell records and tapes and CDs. We buy collections. We swap. We do everything there is to do at a record collector's swap meet. It is a lot of fun. I am going to be set up with Two, maybe even three tables full of prime vinyl, cassettes, CDs, and of course, TPOS label product will all be well represented on May 6th at the Danbury Record and CD Expo. If you go to my website, which is TrashAmericanStyle.us, or you just go to my Facebook page, you will see a flyer. That tells you all the details about the Danbury Record and CD Expo on May 6th. So, going back from September to May, how about April? How about April 29th when I, Malcolm Tent, am playing a somewhat rare solo acoustic date? Yes, indeed you do. You all know that I am the bass player for Anti-Scene. But you can, you can see me strut my stuff with the guitar... Opening up for the Pentagram String Band. They are a satanic bluegrass band on tour. And I've been chosen for the somewhat unenviable task of opening up for them at Cafe 9 in New Haven. It's happening, kids. April 29th. You better believe I'll be bringing my A-game to that one. Lots of uh, songs, stories, pithy observations, and heavy strumming. 
on my probably sparkly blue electric guitar, but if not that, I'll be bringing out my, uh, boy, I miss said that, my sparkly blue acoustic guitar, which I'm known for. But since I'm still in a kind of post-surgical condition where it's very difficult to play acoustic guitar, I might be using my electric guitar. I wonder if you guys can see. Can you guys see the scar on the back of my hand? Is the scar visible? The surgical scar? You can kind of see it if you look closely enough. I don't know if a different light helps it, but yeah, they sliced me open and they fixed some broken bones I'd had in my wrist for the better part of 30 years. So I'm happy to say that I'm no longer in constant pain, but we're about nine months away, nine months out of my surgery, and it's still, I haven't regained all of my function in my fret hand. So doesn't matter. I'm not going to be stopped. I'm going to play regardless. I'm going to play regardless. April 29th, Cafe 9, New Haven, me, and the Pentagram String Band. I believe that's all we got on the bulletin board, with the exception of my usual invitations for you to check out my label and store on Discogs, eBay, and Bandcamp because I got a lot of good stuff, and you need, want, and deserve a lot of good stuff. If you can't make it to the Danbury Records CD Expo on May 6th, you can always visit my internet presences on Bandcamp, Discogs, and eBay. All right, gang, that's the bulletin board. Let's take a look at the mail, shall we? Not a whole ton of mail that we're going to reveal today, but um, I think it's a couple of really good items. Let me reach over here and grab the Million Mile Scissors. Mm, yep, here they are. These scissors have cut a million miles worth of paper, cardboard, manila envelopes, packing tape. And it was all done approximately four inches at a time. So we're going to add a few inches to the Million Mile, million mile Scissors today. First, we're going to open up an envelope from Dennis Highland. And I like this real honest-to-God handwriting. Malcolm Tent, P.O. Box 3626, Newtown, Connecticut, 06470. Dennis Highland is a real good dude. He is the United States Emissary for Jack Hammer Records. Jack Hammer is the Japanese label that has released some anti-scene stuff in Japan. And uh, also in the U.S., thanks to his good efforts. Dennis is also the guy who promotes our shows in Mobile, Alabama. He is a fantastic host. Always makes sure the bands are treated right. He is also in the most excellent band, Future Hate. And he just sent me something. I think I know what this is. We're going to find out for sure. This is a cold reveal. I just cut... The envelope, and now I'm taking the contents out. And what's inside the envelope? Another envelope. A mystery wrapped in a riddle. Packaged in an enigma. We're going to open it up, and ah, uh, yes, this is kind of what I would thought it was. It's kind of what I was hoping it was. I love... I'm sure you guys could probably guess this. I love artifacts. I love printed matter. And I love seeing anti-scene on a Japanese flyer promoting the release that we did on Jack Hammer Records, the Guyana Grape Split 10-inch EP with us and Before I Hang from Hattiesburg, Mississippi. Look at that. That is authentic Japanese flyer action. And there we are, and thus there I am, in full color. Thank you, Dennis, for sending me this so I can add it to my scrapbook. A lot of scraps in that there scrapbook. And there's a few more. Thank you very much. Now we've got the big reveal here. I don't know exactly what this is. This is from my pal Alan Versapellis, and I hope I pronounced your last name correctly. Alan is not only a booster of Tent Talks tunes, but he is a musician and an artist. And he sent me an elaborately packaged thing. It's got an envelope taped to a mailer. It's got some stern admonitions for the Postal Service workers. If you bend this package, Jesus won't come back. Fragile. Can you read it? 
Apparently they can read and apparently they do want Jesus to come back because the package has arrived safe and sound. So let's grab ye million mile scissors and commence to slice in this mother open to see exactly what we got. This is a cold reveal, kids. I have no knowledge whatsoever of what's in here. As you can see, it's very well sealed. So we're going to take the million mile scissors and we're going to go cut, cut, cut. We're going to go snip, snip, snip. We're going to go slice, slice, slice. As George Clinton would say, we're going to cut the roof. We're going to cut the tape off of this sucker. And we're going to tear the roof off of it. Why not? Why not go all the way? You know what I mean? Now this first part of the package here. Hello, Chad Cochran, tuning in right now. Good to see you. You're just in time. We're going to see what exactly is inside the top part of the package, which was so, so well put together. It's the envelope. I think I might hear a cassette or two or three. I don't know. We're finding out. We're all in this together, kids. We're all in this together. It has been opened. I'm looking in. I'm on the outside looking in. I'm reaching my hand into it. I'm pulling out the contents. And we just dropped some stickers. The stickers are... for Jello Swayze. I'm assuming that's Alan's band. And a handwritten note saying thank you for the music and TTT. Thank you, Alan. And what did we get? What do we have here? We have, well, what do you know? We have two different Jello Swayze CDs, which I will definitely come in handy on my next long ass drive to Charlotte, North Carolina. 13 and a half hours one way and I got a CD player in my car. So these things really, really are very useful. And an Alan Versapellis solo disc entitled Covered in Blood. I have covered up all the naughty bits so as not to get banned from all platforms. Thank you, Alan. I look forward to checking these out. That's only part one. Here's part two. What's in the mailer? What could possibly be in this mailer which was not bent by the U.S. Postal Service? What could it possibly be? Let's minimize this message that just came through here. All right, we're going to get out the scissors and we're going to cut some tape. You've heard the expression about cutting through the red tape. I'm going to cut through the clear tape right now. By hook or by crook, one way or another, this package is going to be opened. What on earth can this portend? I am curious yellow. All right. The guy who graduated top 10% of his class was able to successfully open up the package. And Alan, who happens to be tuned in right now, says that, oh, that his uh, Covered in Blood CD does indeed... Where is it? I don't see it. Hey, there it is. Alan covered My God Can Beat Up Your God. A song written by me and performed by my band Broken Talent on our first record in 1984, which was then covered by Anti-Scene in 1992 and is still sporadically a part of our set to this very day. Well, Alan, my ego has been stroked, stoked, and uh, definitely not choked by your inclusion of my humble composition on your album. Thanks, dude. That gives me double incentive to pop it into the ye old CD player when I'm on that 13 and a half hour drive to Charlotte, North Carolina. You give me something to listen to and while away the hours. Mazel tov, dude. But what am I going to listen to when I'm at home? I don't have a, I don't have a record player in the car. This is going to be some home listening, y'all. 
Ah, now Alan knows me very well. Alan knows my absolute mania for D-E-V-O from O-H-I-O. And look at that. Alan has just out of the blue, unsolicited, sent me the white label promo 12-inch single for Devo theme for Dr. Detroit. Very cool. Very cool. I seem to recall this has two different mixes of the title track. Yep, you've got a lengthy, extension, a lengthy extended version. And you've got... Uh, oh, no extended version. Yes. Lengthy extended version and the regular version and a non-album B-side called Love Love. And a special hype sticker that appeared only, I believe, on the promo copies. Those might, that might have appeared on the stock copies, but I have not seen a sealed stock copy ever, I don't think, so I don't know. Maybe some of you guys who are even more obsessive about Devo can tell me, but I'm pretty sure that is a promo-only hype sticker. Alan, thank you very much. I'm going to sit down and examine this with the microscope because that's what I do with Devo Records because it's so much fun. Look at that. It's in beautiful mint condition, too. Mm -mm -mm. If this were the age of payola, I'd say that you succeeded fantastically. Alan, thank you again for the great mail call today, which I'm able to share with all of my people out there on Tent Talks Tunes. Waka. A toast of Danbury Tap. <clears throat> All right, we got one little slight detour back to the uh, bulletin board. A lot of people have been asking, and I'm happy to report that it's officially out. Has actually been out for a little while now. The Bloody Apostles 7-inch EP is out. It is officially 100% out. Look at that. I've got it in my hand right now. That's the front. That's the back. The Bloody Apostles is a super group featuring myself on the bass guitar, P.P. Duvet, late of the Murder Junkies on vocals, Paul Ledney of Profanatica on drums, and Brian Zikafus, the visual artist on guitar. A total super group. This came out on the Hell's Headbangers label on very, very dark black vinyl. I was looking at the Hell's Headbangers website earlier today, and these are still available. I'm very proud of this record. I'm very happy with the way this record came out. It is very heavy, very fast, quite brutal, and um, what can I say? It's a masterpiece. A masterpiece. And I uh, recommend that you get it before it gets sold out. Oh, this is a good one. Yes, Bloody Apostles, officially out on Hell's Headbangers Records. You've been warned. Mike Lesser out there in Vancouver is raising a toast of his Vancouver tap. I wonder how Vancouver tap stacks up against Danbury tap in the bouquet department and the heavy metal department. Danbury tap water for a very long time was famous for its high mercury content. Just a little factoid there for you. <clears throat> All right, so we're going to get into what is right now the meat of the matter on Tent Talks Tune is we're going to revisit not one, but two obsessions of mine. Yes, you get a bonus obsession today. I was, I posted about um, this guy right here. You saw maybe the picture of Joe Bryath. I did an episode of Tent Talks Tunes a while ago devoted to David Bowie wannabes, David Bowie ripoffs, like for that one very brief and very strange moment in time when a lot of people thought they could make money off of being a gay space guy. And so you had people like Joe Bryath releasing albums that were definitely, definitely owing a lot to David Bowie's imagery, that owed a lot to David Bowie's sexuality, that owed a lot to David Bowie's stage presentation. There were a few others like Joe Bryath, and if you want to hear all about it, you can go on to my 
YouTube channel and look up the archived episode of Tent Talks Tunes featuring the gay spacemen who just kind of came and went because their biggest the biggest crime of every single one of those guys was that they weren't David Bowie. I mean, pretty simple, you know. I And anybody who's watched this show before knows that I really am a big fan of cynical cash-ins. I really love it when there's a bandwagon built upon the talents and abilities of a, 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 like a totally singular artist and everybody jumps on that bandwagon trying to be just like that completely unique singular artist. It happened with Bowie. It happened um, with the Village People with one single record that I know of. There is one band called Revanche who tried to be Village People Jr. Stuff like that. I'm really a big fan of that because everybody knows who the originators are and most people kind of forget the duplicators, but I think there's a lot of gold to be mined from those duplicators, especially when they're real cheesy and real sleazy and really cynical <clears throat> and really just only in it for the cash grab. So from that perspective, that's why I was really intrigued by Joe Bryant because the guy totally came and went. He released these two albums on Elektra, circa 1973. Neither of them sold for Jack. I mean, they were they didn't chart. They weren't even blips on the radar. They just really came and went. And for the longest time ever, the only evidence this guy even existed was the fact that you would occasionally find copies of his second album in the dollar bins or the cheap bins. To this day, this is the only copy of his first album I've ever found. I've, I've never seen or held another copy of his first album except for this very one. The second one, you used to be able to see, you know, occasionally. And if you were interested in this kind of weirdo stuff, you'd grab it. <clears throat> so that was it. All we knew were these two records by this guy Joe Bryant who looked kind of bizarre. The second one's called Creature of the Street. It's got this really kind of amateurishly rendered picture of something. You can't really tell what's going on, but there is something going on. It is called Creatures of the Street. Mysteries, once again, abound. Now, <clears throat> I was talking to my younger brother on the phone a little while ago, and he actually went back on my YouTube channel and found that episode about the David Bowie wannabes. And my youngest brother was always very much into Bowie. And I, I guess the subject matter just intrigued him. So he ended up finding a documentary on Joe Bryant. And I never knew there was a documentary on this guy. So when my brother told me about it, I, of course, jumped right on it because I want to know more about this dude, this completely enigmatic, mysterious not even one hit wonder. We're talking about a big zero hit wonder who released two albums and then just disappeared entirely. And I'm not going to be a spoiler. I'm not going to reveal too much about the movie, but all I will say is that I came across with a new respect for Joe Bryant. The one thing that I didn't know about Joe Bryant was he actually was a serious musician a virtuoso pianist and composer. Like, this guy could really rip on the piano. And by looking at the credits of the albums more carefully, he actually wrote just about everything, co-produced, and, you know, had the visual concepts and everything. So there actually was some thought put behind this, and there were actually ideas behind it. And also, even more interestingly, I found out that his first album and if I get the chronology correct, was actually in production before David Bowie hit it big. I might be misremembering that, but I definitely kind of want to say that Joe Bryant was doing his thing before anybody really thought they could make money off of being a David Bowie clone. So it just might be one of those untimely, unfortunate coincidences that Joe Bryant's writing style just happened to be an awful lot like David Bowie's writing style. Because when you listen to these two albums, there are Bowieisms all 
over the damn place. Maybe there are more so on the second album because by then Bowie definitely had started to hit. I don't know. But the similarities are ridiculous. And it just might be an un uncanny coincidence, but you cannot escape the, the compositional sound alike between Joe Bryath and David Bowie. And the presentation, well, speak for you, you know, you can see for yourself. So I went back and re-listened to both of the re-listened to both of these albums. And <clears throat> I always there were always tracks on both of these records that I liked and I thought were pretty good. But now knowing more of the story, I I realize that musically this guy was really, really good. The problem, as it always was, was his voice. He's one of those dudes who always had to try to sing in the higher registers. He was always trying to hit the highest note possible. He was like an eight, like an eighties hair metal singer who didn't have any sense of restraint and just always went for the absolute top of their range, you know, to the exclusion of all subtlety and any respect for melody. It's just like horrific after a short little while. And he doesn't have that. Mm, how do you describe eighties hair metal vocals? Um, how do you describe them? How would you people out there, I'm at a loss for words right now. I want to see what you, the viewers, how would you describe your average 80s hair metal high-pitched vocalist? Let's see some adjectives. Let's see some commentary. It doesn't even have to be snide. I'm just looking at good words to describe an 80s hair metal vocalist who does not know how to sing anything other than the highest, screechiest, no, it's possible. Let's see. Ray from Tucson says hysterical at best. John Farrell, who is still in Boise, I believe, says screaming. Robin, ah, Robin Renee says forceful falsetto. I like that. Neil Agneta says shrill. I think forceful falsetto. Uh, Josh Stiles says sensual. <laughs> but Josh Stiles of Daddy Long Legs is a bit of a contrarian in these musical matters. But we're going to let Josh Stiles slide, because I tried to raise him up right, and I think I did. What do we got here? Everything from sensual to forceful falsetto. I'm going to stick with forceful falsetto. The problem with Joe Bryath is that when he goes to hit those high notes, he just kind of like screeches and grates and kind of... It's not really a growl. It's more like an eh, eh, eh. And he's never able to get away from that eh. And that is what kills the listening experience. As much as I really, really, really want to like these albums in their entirety for what they are, his voice is just like eh, 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 eh. And he just never backs off from that. So after about one side of an album of that, it's like, okay, no more. We're not going to bother flipping this one over. We're just going to put it away. And I think that was Joe Bryant's real Achilles heel. And I'm once again, trying not to be the spoiler about the movie. You really should check out the documentary. It's called Joe Bryant AD as in the letter A and the letter D. It's an excellent documentary. It's really, really good. The, the postscript is that after Joe Bryath was Joe Bryath, he had a career as a cabaret lounge pianist doing old standards by Cole Porter, Irving Berlin, George Gershwin, Marlena Dietrich, people like that. And I swear to God, he was fantastic. Like, hands down, awesome, with like real charisma, with a real look of his own. And guess what? He sings in his more natural lower register and he can really sing. So I think he missed his calling, you know, he really missed his true calling by not being a cabaret singer for his entire life. But then again, if he had never done that, if he had taken that path, we would never actually have these wonderful, weird artifacts from that brief moment when anybody thought they could be David Bowie. 
So Mazel Tov, Joe Bryant, wherever you are. I once again hoist my jug of Danbury tap to you and your music. Not so much your flies, but you and your music. And Josh Stiles has just corroborated my testimony about how good the documentary is. Right on, Mang. So that's one magnificent obsession that we have revisited today. Here's another one. Two magnificent obsessions. Although I don't know how magnificent this one is. Joe Bryath really tried to be magnificent. He gave it his all. He really wanted to be magnificent. Maybe this next band wanted to be magnificent as well. I don't know. But as longtime viewers of Tent Talks Tunes know, <laughs> I have had this downright morbid fascination, yay, perhaps even obsession with Discharge and their album, Grave New World. Once again, I don't want to go too much into detail because I've gone into a lot of detail about this album in the past on Tent Talks Tunes. Go to my YouTube channel, scroll back through the archive and find the episode I did about Discharge, Grave New World. Just to put it in a nutshell, Discharge, one of the most amazing UK punk bands ever, second wave of UK punk, although they started out in 77, they didn't really hit their stride until the early 80s when they unleashed some of the most ferocious, flame-throwing, volcanic punk rock ever heard on the face of this planet. Their albums Hear Nothing, See Nothing, Say Nothing, and Why in particular are just like when you put the needle in the groove, stand back because it's going to be a hurricane coming at you when those songs start. And their singles, wow, incredible. So Discharge were really aces, baby. Aces! Aces of eights, dude! No boxcars for those guys. They were on the toppermost of the poppermost when it came to frantic punk rock in the early 80s. Holy cannoli! <sighs> but then... But then... But then things kind of took a left turn, and with Discharge, it took a very gradual left turn. If you listen to every single Discharge record in order chronologically, you can hear a very definite, you could call it progression, you could call it regression, you could call it digression, but they very definitely start to move in a more heavy metal, hard rock direction. Happened to about a million bands. Some carried off the change successfully. In fact, most did. I, I actually can't really think of too many who absolutely, completely, utterly flopped at it. There are a couple. There are a couple. I'm not going to name names. But maybe if anybody out there has any opinions on that. Hardcore punk rock bands who gradually went into hard rock heavy metal and ended up kind of sucking. If you want to name names, please feel free to leave a comment. I am dedicating this to my magnificent obsession with Discharge and the Grave New World album and the fact that they did eventually evolve into a hard rock heavy metal band and the results, in my opinion, were ghastly. Utterly ghastly. And I've had people who have contacted me and say that they like that era of Discharge. More power to you, man. You like what you like, and that's all there is to it. Just because I think it's ridiculous, that's my problem, not yours. There are people who actually like this album. I don't understand it, but they do. Godspeed, and I hope you listen to it and get a lot of enjoyment out of it. I get a lot of enjoyment out of it, but coming from the different direction, because in my opinion, it's just so goddamn bad. Unbelievable. Oh, let's see. The names are coming in. 
Celtic Frost, Kraut, DRI, COC. You know, I've got an opinion. Mark Deal mentioned Celtic Frost. I'm going to say this. Celtic Frost, who had their one much maligned, hated album called Cold Lake, where they tried to go glam. I'm going to make a heretical statement. I'm going to say that the album itself is better than the albums that came after it. And I'm going to say that Cold Lake might even be better than Into the Pandemonium, the album that came before it. I think that what Cold Lake desperately needs is a remix slash remaster. Because as it stands now, the drums are mixed way high and the guitars are mixed way low. It sounds like Kaka Doo Doo. If they would just bring the guitars up and the drums down, you'd have an album you could actually listen to. And the songs on that album are not bad at all. And its, it's sin was that it was too weird for the hair metal crowd and too hair metal for the death metal crowd. So nobody wanted it. They didn't make any new friends. They just alienated everybody. And every now and again, I'll try to drag out my copy of Cold Lake and give it a listen. And I come to the same conclusion every single time. It's There's a good album in there just dying to get out. And it's just kind of tragic that considering all the reissues and remixes and remasters and deluxe repackages that Celtic Frost has done, as far as I know, Cold Lake is not one of them. And that's the album that would benefit the most from that treatment. So Tom Warrior, if you're out there, do us a favor. You can redeem Cold Lake if you want to. Remix the sucker. And then master it properly and put it out in a deluxe edition so we can actually hear what those songs are supposed to sound like. Cheers. Uh, Josh Stiles mentions SSD. Yeah, I could have mentioned them, definitely. Mm -hmm. I could have mentioned them. I didn't, but I could have. Anyway, <clears throat> and continuing with my magnificent obsession with the Discharge Grave New World and the absolutely catastrophic tour that they undertook in the U.S. to support it, you can imagine how my beady little eyes lit up with joy when I discovered the existence of this. Discharge, the East-West Disaster. Featuring not one, but two complete concerts from that disastrous Grave New World U.S. tour. You might ask, how can one LP, and it is a single LP, one album, on a delightful opaque red vinyl, featuring the kind of weird uh, parakeet logo that Discharge was using for Grave New World, one album, how can one single disc contain two complete concerts? Well, the answer is simple. Each one was terminated abruptly by hostile audience reaction. Yes, indeed he do. Side one contains their first performance of the tour from the Ritz in New York City, which ended when HR, the lead singer of the Bad Brains, dumped a garbage can full of either garbage or ice. We don't know exactly what, but HR dumped a whole garbage can full of something on the stage bringing an end to the concert. Side two features the complete performance from San Francisco about a month later, in which the, aud in which the audience very nearly kills Discharge. <laughs> you can actually hear the sound of something hitting the stage. Boom! And then the guitar cutting out and the band exiting the stage. It's... It's really something. I felt real bad for those guys after hearing that. It's brutal. Well, Harry just made a quick, instantaneous appearance and disappearance. So yeah, two complete life performances from the absolutely career-destroying Grave New World tour contained on one record. It is something that you've got to hear to believe. Ooh, boy. So the Magnificent Obsession continues with more, ep with more evidence of what these guys brought upon themselves when they went 
hair metal. And I will say the one thing that impresses me, and I don't mean like I'm really impressed, but it left an impression on me that, and this happened when I saw them in, uh, in uh, Miami on this on the tour. I saw them on this tour in Miami. Um, the, host the, the, the reception they got in Miami wasn't nearly as hostile as what they got elsewhere, but here they are in front of these incredibly hostile audiences in New York and San Francisco. They didn't make any effort whatsoever to communicate to the audience what it was they were trying to do. Like maybe why do they look the way they look? Why are they, why are they, you know, it's like they, they made no effort at all to try to explain themselves. They didn't try anything. They just let the audience murder them basically and run away. Very strange. Very strange. I would love to interview anybody involved in the making of Grave New World to find out exactly just what the hell was going on, what these guys were thinking or what they weren't thinking. You know, it's just it's just odd, just really odd. So I was very happy to find that copy of the East West disaster in the wild a little while ago and to wrap my ears around that recording from the Ritz show, because I, I never knew there was a recording of that one. So that was really cool. I might play it again when I sign off, because I am a bit of a masochist. I am sort of a glutton for punishment. Uh, Greg Pillon says, pre-crack cocaine. It's true, people still made really bad career decisions, even in the pre-crack era. It's true. <clears throat> All right, I got a few minutes left, so I want to show and tell a few records that I've picked up on recent tours with Anti Scene. I meant to show and tell this one uh, a while ago, back in March, when we did some shows in in the uh, Gulf Coast states. We played in uh, Shreveport, New Orleans, Hattiesburg, and Mobile, Alabama. My friends, the Crawfords, came to our show in Mobile and gifted me with a couple of records. Check this out. Liberace picture disc. Yes, Mr. Showmanship himself on a genuine picture disc LP. It's got that on the front. And hey, guess what? It's got that on the back. Maybe they ran out of picture disc art funds when this was made. But dude, what a concept. A Liberace picture disc. There's only one degree of separation between Joe Bryath and Liberace. Think about that for a second. Meditate upon that just for one second. And the Crawfords also gifted me with one of the great, great, terrible records of all time. One of the worst of the worst, and therefore one of my very favorites. The eponymous album by Telly Savalas. Yes. He apparently has a parasitic twin growing out of his back. I can't tell what's going on there, but people of my generation who watched Kojak know all about Telly. Maybe some of you youngsters do as well. He did a great job of playing a detective on TV. He does a lousy job of trying to sing songs in a studio. I mean, like, terrible dudes. Like, oh my God, please send this guy home. But he ended up, he's made like probably six or seven albums. And apparently was a big star in Europe and had hit singles. I can't even guess how these things happen. Fine actor. Not a singer. If you guys like bad music, the way I like bad music, Telly Savalas is highly recommended. Highly recommended. Other magnificent obsessions of mine that I just happened to find tangible evidence of while I was in the field. Did some record shopping in Nashville and came up with this little gem on the Boblo label. Don't know if you guys can see that it's a record by Jimmy Ellis. There you go on the A side. And here comes that wonderful feeling again on the B side. Now you might say, Jimmy Ellis, Jimmy Ellis. What's so special about Jimmy Ellis? Well, once again, if you trawl my past episodes of Tent Talks Tunes on YouTube, you will find lots of mention about a guy named Orion. And what was Orion's deal? Well, all I'm going to say, 
because I don't like to ruin any surprises. All I'm going to say is that shortly after Elvis Presley died, <clears throat> a mysterious masked singer appeared on the scene. Boy, he kind of looked like Elvis, and he sure did kind of sound like Elvis, but you couldn't tell because he wore a mask around his eyes. And his name was Orion. And he released a bunch of records on the Sun label. <gasps> Same label that Elvis was on. Oh my God. Could it be? Could it be? Well, it could have been. Except some people who don't believe in magic. Some people who don't believe in fairy tales. Started spreading the word that Orion was really a guy named Jimmy Ellis who had a bunch of singles on labels like Boblo. That weren't really hits. In fact, they weren't hits at all, but um, there were plenty of them. Jenny DeSoto, who just tuned in. Jenny, you know all about Jimmy Ellis and Orion, I'll betcha. Are they the same guy? Could it possibly be so? I hope not. But anyway, just because I'm morbidly obsessed with Orion, and just thinking that maybe, maybe the naysayers are right, and maybe the man behind the mysterious sequin mask really is Jimmy Ellis, I picked up this Jimmy Ellis 45 when I was in Nashville. And it is a gem in my collection. Because Jimmy Ellis records have been comped and booted before, this is my first genuine Jimmy Ellis site on the Boblo label. And I'm sure it's just coincidence, too. Mere coincidence, but in the same box of records in Nashville, you got it. A 45 by the mysterious masked man himself, Orion, on the Sun Records label, yellow vinyl promo, baby. Yellow vinyl promotional only, not for sale. I don't care if it was not for sale. I paid a dollar for it, and I'm happy I did. Jimmy Ellis, Orion. I mean, what happens if you put them next to each other? They don't cancel each other out. No weird vibrations between the two. I don't know. We know for a fact that Jimmy Ellis and Orion records have been seen in the same place at the same time. It's happening right here, right now. They themselves were never seen in the same place at the same time, but their records have been. It's official. 100% official. Both from the same box of Junk 45s in Nashville, Tennessee. And I also got this really good one. Also paid one whole dollar for this. Considering that the original retail was $2, I got a bargain. A message to Elvis's fans and to my friends and whoever you are by Elvis's uncle, Vester on the very imaginatively named Vesprez label. The one time that I visited Graceland, which was the home of Elvis Presley, old Uncle Vester himself was there behind the desk. He had a great big old stack of books he had written and a great big stack of these 45s. And he was sitting there looking all pissed off like he'd rather be anywhere else than behind that table with all those unsold records and all those unsold books. And he looked so grim and so dour and so angry that I was not going to go near the guy. Not even to pay $2 for his record. Wasn't going to do it. Guy scared me away. But it worked out for the better. All I had to do then was wait 30 years to pay $1 for it. When you take inflation into account, it means I got it for free, practically. So you see, guys, patience pays off. If you, pay, if you wait 30 years, quite often you can get the $2 record for $1. Sage advice. And I listen to it, and it's pretty bad. There's more that I could talk about. You know, that's, that's the problem. There's always more that I could talk about. There's always more. There are so many records, and so many of them are so cool, and I pick up so many of them when I'm on the road. But 
my time's just about out. I like to go for about an hour every week. I don't want to try anybody's patience. Don't want to try my larynx. It's a very sensitive larynx. You'd never guess when you see me play live. But I, I talk too much and my larynx is kind of sore, so I got to bag out. So we'll just do one quick summation of what's going on. Anti-Scene 40th Anniversary Show, Spartanburg, South Carolina, September 30th. I'll be there. You should be there. The Pentagram String Band, Cafe 9, New Haven, April 29th. I'm opening. You should be in the audience. Danbury Record and CD Expo, May 6th. VFW Hall number 149 in Danbury. I'm going to be selling tons of damn good records, tapes, and CDs. You should be there shopping. And of course, my label, my web store, TPOS, on Discogs, eBay, and Bandcamp. And before I sign off, Jenny DeSoto wants to know if I've ever found a Johnny Powers record. I have not. I've never come across a Johnny Powers record. And I wish that situation could be rectified. But who knows? Maybe at the Danbury Record and CD Expo on May 6th, I'll find one or two or three or four. Who knows? Anyway, guys, thank you for tuning in and letting me rant, rave, rage, and ramble about people like Joe Bryath and Orion and Discharge and Jimmy Ellis and Liberace and Telly Savalas, Devo. It's always a pleasure. I love getting able to hang out with you guys virtually and see what you all have to say. I'll be checking out your comments later after I sign off. Um, I'm going to be home for the next few weeks at least, so we should have a somewhat more regular schedule of Tent Talks Tunes, which means that Lord willing and the creeks don't rise, I'll be back in about 167 hours' time. So till we meet again, this is Malcontent saying so long from the nutmeg state.